Welcome back. So now we're going to look at chapter 9. This is the last chapter in part 3 of the book, Muscle Force Optimization. Here's a quick agenda. We'll look at the force distribution problem. This is sometimes called the muscle force sharing problem or the muscle redundancy problem. We'll see a simple static optimization example. And then in the next video, we'll look at dynamic optimization. Again, somewhat briefly, these are very deep topics. We could go into a lot of detail. We don't have time for that. In this video, we'll focus on these first two points here. So let's refresh our memory for where we are in this inverse dynamic analysis. We brought someone into the lab, collected mocap data. We used the information in chapter 7 to perform inverse kinematics and compute the skeletal joint angles. We did some filtering and differentiation. And then in chapter 8, we saw inverse dynamics to compute the net joint forces and moments. Now we're going to use optimization to estimate the muscle forces. And why do we need optimization? Well, we have more muscles in the body than we have degrees of freedom. This is an overactuated system. So somehow the body's coordinating all the muscles to produce motion. And there's an infinite possible number of solutions there. The body has to pick one of these. And so does our software. So what is a joint moment? We saw this picture before in chapter 8. We looked at going from all the forces in the biological system to the equivalent system of net forces and moments. Now we're going to go in the opposite direction. Suppose we have the net forces and moments from chapter 8. We want to resolve them into individual muscle forces to understand more about how movement was generated. Once we know what the muscle forces were, we can go on to look at muscle coordination, metabolic cost, and a whole lot of other variables that are very interesting. So what factors affect how much each muscle will contribute to a net joint moment? There are a bunch of muscles here in this little diagram. We have major extensors, gastrocnemius, soleus, tibialis posterior. The major flexors on the other side, the TA and EDL. And for these five muscles, how would the body select from among these five muscles? How would they be coordinated to produce a net ankle moment? What factors would affect this? Well, maybe one muscle is particularly tired, so the body would favor using a different muscle. Maybe you're generating a very large moment, so you absolutely need to uh, excite all of the muscles that could potentially produce that moment. A maximal height jump, for example, might be that kind of situation. So we have this force distribution problem, or force sharing problem, or muscle redundancy problem. The issue is that we have more muscles than degrees of freedom. Somehow, we have to figure out, for these muscles, how much force was each one generating. So the moment generated about the ankle will be the sum of all the muscle moments plus the sum of moments due to other structures. We'll neglect the other structures for now, just to simplify the problem a little bit. So the sum of the muscle moments will be the sum of the contributions from all the flexors and the sum of all the contributions from the extensors. They're acting in opposite directions, of course. We have that negative sign there. And F is the number of flexors, and E is the number of extensors. And the moment that each muscle generates, remember back from chapter 6, we have the force times the moment arm. So here we have one equation, and we have a whole bunch of unknowns. We have the contribution from each one of the muscles. All of those are unknowns. So how are we going to solve this problem? So we have way more unknowns than the equations. How are we going to solve this system? One strategy is to make the number of equations equal to the number of unknowns, either by making assumptions that reduces the number of unknowns, or adding equations. So in this specific example, at the ankle, how might we reduce the number of unknowns? Well, suppose we're generating a moment only in one direction. Maybe the muscles on the other side are not generating any force. Maybe we can increase the number of equations by assuming that all the muscles on one side of the ankle generate the same force, or have the same excitation, or have the same stress. In that case, we'd be making the number of equations equal the number of unknowns. So here's a generic optimization problem. Let's take a look at this. You can write every optimization problem more or less in this form. First of all, we have what's called the objective function or the cost function. It's some function of x. x, these are called the design variables. These are the variables for which we want values. We don't know what the values should be. We're asking the optimizer, find us values for these variables such that we're getting as low a number here as possible from this function. 
So we're minimizing some function. This is actually not, uh, not an issue. Even if we're trying to maximize something, we can simply minimize the negative. So this is not a limitation, but many times you'll see just a generic optimization problem written as a minimization problem. So we want to adjust these design variables x to minimize the objective function j. And we have some constraints. So we want to accomplish this feat subject to satisfying all these constraints. So we have perhaps some inequality constraints. So there'd be some function of the design variables must be less than or equal to 0. We might have some equality constraints like Newton's laws, f equals ma. We might have other equality constraints in our system. So we have some functions. Again, they're functions of design variables. These must be equal to 0. And then we have some bounds on our design variables. Uh, in the case of muscle forces, every force must be between 0 and the maximum force that the muscle can generate. If these are excitations, the bounds would be between 0 and 1, etc. Revisiting our simple example here, let's take a look at some possible ways to set up an optimization problem to solve this. So here we're minimizing some function of the muscle forces. We're assuming the muscle forces are our design variables. What are the constraints? Well, we need to generate the given net joint moment. This would be the joint moment, let's say, that we computed in chapter 8 for a particular time point. So we need to compute what the forces are from each of the muscles in order to generate that joint moment. And then we have some constraints here. All the muscle forces must be greater than 0 and less than the maximum that the muscle can generate. And we also have these moment arms. Presumably, we would know that from our kinematic analysis. So what might our objective function be? One possibility is that we want to minimize the total muscle force. Why don't you take a minute and think about what would happen if we tried to minimize the total muscle force? So our objective function is just to get the smallest possible number when we add up all the forces generated by the muscles. What do you think the solution would look like? So the optimizer will favor using the muscle that has the largest moment arm. And it will use that muscle as much as possible until it reaches its maximum. And that will start to recruit the muscle with the next highest moment arm. That's not at all going to be a biologically reasonable uh, solution. There are better objective functions we might try. We might try minimizing the total muscle stress, thinking that the body would try to avoid injury. So we want to minimize some measure of stress. We might choose other objective functions. This one is somewhat similar to metabolic energy. There is a study that found that we can cube the muscle stress, get a good approximation of metabolic energy in some cases. OK, so we need to select an objective function. We could pick uh, all kinds of different objective functions. And the objective function we pick will have a dramatic effect on the solution we get. Oftentimes, we'll pick an objective function that we think makes a lot of sense, but the solution we get is complete nonsense. And so often, it's an iterative process of defining an optimization problem, looking at the solution the optimizer delivers, and then refining it, perhaps adding constraints to avoid solutions we don't like. So we'll take another look at this in the next video, where we'll look at dynamic optimization.